morning, brethren. On the Lord's day, John heard a strong voice calling to him like a trumpet from an angel of the Most High, for John was about to partake in a mighty revelation. The voice said to him, saying, I am the Alpha and Omega, the first and the last, and what thou seest, write in a book, and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia, unto Ephesus, unto Smyrna, unto Pergamos, unto Thyatira, unto Sardis, unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. These letters have a specific message to, from Christ to address their condition. He starts out every message by addressing who he is. Yeah. However, Christ doesn't just outright say that he is Christ. He exhorts them accordingly with a description of who he is. To the church of Ephesus, who left their first love, these things saith he that holdeth the seven stars in his right hand, who walketh in the midst of the seven golden candlesticks. To the church of Pergamos, who taught Balak to cast stumbling blocks before Israel and held unto ungodly doctrine, these things saith he, who hath this, hath this sharp sword with two edges. To the church of Thyatira, who believed Jezebel was a prophetess and abided in her ways, these things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. To the church of Sardis, who was not found profitable in the eyes of the Lord, these things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. Church of Philadelphia, who was known for their charity among men, these things saith he that is holy, he that is true, he that hath the key of David, he that openeth and no man shutteth, and shutteth and no man openeth. And Laodicea, who was lukewarm and tempted to compromise, these things saith the Amen, the faithful and the true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. The church of Smyrna was a faithful church. The church is described as rich in heaven, however very poor on earth. They have what seemed to be an endless list of tribulation. In the account, you can almost feel the discouragement from our own experiences that they, they felt for being tried. And Jesus starts his message to Smyrna saying, these things say the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. Christ, just testifying who he is, is an exhortation in itself. Those who know the taste of the temptation and hardship can be rather encouraged knowing that their forerunner has seen and tasted of these things. I am the first and the last. I have been around since time began before history existed. I am an unchanging God who is steadfast and true. <laughs> There is comfort in knowing that God is all-knowing, that the Creator is the one in control of tribulations that face us, that there is an order to these events. We follow a merciful God who does not take pleasure in the death of the wicked. He is a righteous God who does not act out of emotion, but admonishes us as if a father towards his children. As quickly, as he can to start the storm and trouble the waters, quickly he can calm the sea. In times of tribulation and trial, there's an assurance that he hears our prayers. Thus, in the case of Smyrna, when Christ introduces himself as the first and the last, he was ministering to them, saying, Do not fret, Smyrna, I know of your struggles. Amen. However, Christ didn't just stop there. For he continued by saying, which was dead and is alive. The thing that greatly separates our God from idols is that Christ has tasted death. Christ humbled himself greatly beyond our understanding. He went from dwelling in the Godhead and humbled himself just below angels so that he can do a work that no man born of Adam can do. He had been born as a baby and matured to a man. And during that time, he had experienced firsthand difficulties that this world had to offer. Christ had experienced temptations. He had experienced the feeling of hunger and thirst. 
He had dealt with people who falsely accused him of unrighteous things. He knows the feeling of being betrayed by someone close to him. The people who were supposed to be his allies sought for his death. He was mocked, spit on, and beaten. He had, felt the weight, uh, he had felt the weight of carrying his own cross. He knows the feeling of the nails piercing his hands and feet. He knows what it's like to be in pain and suffer. He knows the weight of sin because he bore it for others. He even knows the feeling of the father turning his back on him. Even though he did not do anything personally to deserve death, he laid it down so that God could be justified in dealing righteously with men. Amen. Christ, who was the only perfect being who walked on this earth, who owned no sin and was found faultless, suffered. Even he, Christ Jesus, the Son of God, did not live a life without hardship. However, if he didn't overcome tribulations, he wouldn't be the forerunner that he is. He wouldn't be able to say, be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Amen. He didn't just die. No, he overcame death. Yeah. He Amen. is the Alpha and the Omega. Amen. He holds the seven stars in his right hand and walks in the midst of the candlesticks. He has the sharp sword with two edges. His eyes are like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. Yeah. He has the seven spirits of God. He is holy. He is true. He has the keys of David. He, he openeth and no man shutteth and shutteth and no man openeth. He is the amen, the faithful and true witness. Amen. He is our intercessor, our forerunner, our shepherd, our savior that sits on the heavenly throne along with his father. Amen. In this letter to Smyrna, Christ speaks to them and even speaks to us in this manner. I am an unchanging God who sees and knows everything. I will not break a bruised reed or quench a smoking flax. Be thou faithful unto me and I will give thee a crown of life. In this world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer. I have overcome the world. Yes. Amen. Amen. I'll also be using Revelation 2, chapter 2, verse 8. These things say the first and the last, which was dead and is alive. When we speak of the attributes of Jesus, we cannot view them as separate parts, but all things that work in one accord together. In the church, we have many parts that comprise of one whole unit, which is the body of Christ. All these parts function together simultaneously and harmoniously to bring glory to God. Many of us here are musicians. If we were all to play our instruments at the same time, in different keys, different songs, there is nothing pleasant whatsoever about that. It's when we all play in the same key, when we all play the same, same song, that these various instruments can each be playing their different part within the song set, that they all produce one beautiful, pleasant song. Yeah. Jesus did not start a work within us and allow us to be placed into spiritual solitary confinement without any contact with himself just so he can ultimately judge us in the end. Salvation is ever working, and Jesus must be in the midst of the churches for him to rightly have any claim to being the first and the last. We could not survive those trials and tribulations in the meantime if Jesus were to just abandon us. Being the first and the last tells us that he will supply all our need in the meantime. He will, throughout trials and tribulations, send ways to encourage us. If it seems that he is not, we can remember the encouraging promises that he has given. I am the way, the truth, and the life. He also said, hey, I want to prepare a place for you. If Jesus only saw the beginning and the end of all things and, had not, and was unable to see the middle, he could not have told the church at Smyrna that he knows of their works. He could not tell them that I know your trials. He could not say, I know your tribulations. I know your poverty. He couldn't even say, I know that you're actually rich in heaven. Right. He would see that the brethren of Smyrna entered into salvation, and then he would be in the dark until he were to return, 
and the end result would actually be a surprise to him. So he confirms us until the end. He is the reason why we are, we are able to be found unreprovable and why it is possible for believers to be forgiven of their sins. It is why when he returns, we are found acceptable to God. Now Christ is dead, well, Christ was dead and is now alive, so also are those who bear his name. Our old man is crucified on the cross that we might live. For I am crucified with Christ, that I'm, but nevertheless I live, yet not myself, but Christ that liveth within me. Yes. Now we join in this in baptism, which is the form of the doctrine, which is Romans 6, 17. And when he died, the sin of the world that was upon him went to the grave with him. When he rose to life, those sins did not come back with him. Amen. The Ethiopian recognized this, and upon seeing the water, said, Is there a reason I should not be baptized? Was dead is a past tense and is alive is present tense. This is basic grammar in any language. Jesus did not die and stay dead, but instead rose on the third day, which is a tenet integral to salvation. If Christ were still dead, he could not be seated in heavenly places. And he could not be currently interceding for us in those places. If he were still dead, his role as being the first and the last would actually be a completely moot point. He would meet us in the judgment essentially on this exact same level as we are. This would be tantamount to be a part of the Godhead having died, and that being the end of it. God forbid. Jesus was made a little lower than angels to be raised so that his enemies can be his footstool for his feet. This is, like has been said this weekend several times, that something that can be said only of Jesus. Lazarus died and he was raised back to life, but today he is dead. The son of the widow of Nain had died, was risen back to life, but today... He's dead. When Christ died, the prophets came back to life. But guess what? Today, they're dead. In Christ was life, and the life was the light of men. He is the candle on the hill. He is the captain of our salvation. He is the beacon on the mountaintop. He is the way, the truth, and the life. The dispensation of life from Christ could only come if he is alive. And brethren, he is alive. Amen. So we'll sum this up with a few final statements. Before Abraham was, I am. He was there before the beginning of all things. Christ gave up his ghost. He willingly died. No man could take it from him. Christ on the third day could not be found among the dead, for he had arisen just as he said he would. Yeah. He who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. I'll have a prayer for Sister June before she comes up and have our Bible class this morning. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the good things we've heard this weekend about what your son is doing right now in the midst of the churches. We pray a blessing on Sister June as she speaks to us and shares with us what she has studied in this, in this area. We pray that we, she may be a benefit unto the, those who hear and that we may in turn be a benefit unto her. Send your sons and we pray. Amen.